All right, thanks everybody for joining us for the uh, City of Courtney Committee of the Whole meeting for April 26, 2021. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that uh, the land in which we gather and are zooming on is the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, and I want to thank them for allowing us to do this. Uh, due to the coronavirus COVID-19 emergency, the City of Courtney with authority of Ministerial Order M192 Local Government Meetings and Bylaw Process COVID-19 Order Number 3 implemented changes to its open council meetings. In the interest of public health and safety and in accordance with Section 3.1 of Ministerial Order Number uh, 3 uh, M192, in-person attendance by uh, members of the public at council meetings will not be permitted until further notice. Council meetings are presided over by the mayor or acting mayor with electronic participation by council and staff via live uh, web streaming. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we're gonna bury the agenda. I, I would like to move the council bury the order of the April 26, 2021 committee at the whole agenda. So that item 1.2.1, the 2020 audited financial statements presentation facilitated by Corey Vanderhorst, MNP, um, uh, stuff in brackets. Brackets under one staff report's presentation is received before 1.1.1, emergency pandemic shelter 685 Cliff Avenue, the Connect Warming Center. Second that. Excellent. Thanks for that. And um, uh, anybody opposed? Seeing nobody opposed, uh, I will we'll move this and I will pass this over to staff to introduce. Um, uh, Mayor? Steve. Yes. Do you want me just to move the motion then? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm happy to move um, that based on today's staff report, the 2020 audited financial statements that council approve option one and approve the audited financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2020. Can second that. Excellent. And, uh, and actually, uh, with this, I'll um, pass this over to staff, um, uh, CAO, uh, Mr. Jeff Garbett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, Ms. Renata Vika is going to introduce um, our uh, guest tonight. Thank you through the CEO to Mayor and Council, Corey Vanderhorst from MNP, the accounting firm who does the annual financial statement audit for the city of Courtney. He's here. Corey will present the audit findings as well as the 2020 consolidated financial statements. However, before I turn it over to Corey, I would like to acknowledge our finance staff. Everyone, uh, again, worked very hard this year to prepare these financial statements. And in particular, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, Krista McClintock, our accountant, uh, who assisted me with the drafting. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Corey. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Good afternoon, everybody. Mayor and Council, uh, thank you for having me here today. I am going to share a screen, so bear with me as we go through some technology. I hope that worked. Can everybody see the presentation? Yep. Great. Okay. Now I've lost your video feed. Oh, way over there. All right. There we go. Um, let's see what we're doing here. Apologies for that. My mouse wants to scroll faster than I can talk. All right. There we go. Uh, so I'll take you through, uh, you know, as we've done in the past years through an audit presentation, talk a little bit about the finance, uh, financial results for 2020, a little bit about our audit process, and then uh, as we, as I've done in the past years, end on a little bit of our trend and ratio analysis. And instead of just looking at 2020, we look at the last four to five years. Um, I, I do want to uh, echo Renata's comments off the start of thank you to uh, city staff, especially in the finance department, but not just in finance. We we talk to many departments. Um, another uh, pandemic audit, remote audit, where there's lots of emails going back and forth, lots of uh, documents being uh, shared in our in our secure uh, client portal. So it, it is. Uh, <laughs> It, it goes as smoothly as it could. Um, we did have some teams on site being uh, secure and, and safe um, and following uh, the public health orders and the guidelines for safety of your staff and ours, but uh, it's definitely not, not a normal year um, for trying to get an audit done. So uh, I've, I've run through the, the topics here, but we'll start right in with the financial statement highlights. A reminder again, what you're seeing here today is the consolidated results 
uh, at the city, the, the general fund, water, sewer, capital, reserves, gaming fund, everything all together. So as you've been going throughout the year, you would be seeing various reports from your finance team. Um, and sometimes it would be general fund and other things. This We're wrapping everything together. Uh, and so sometimes that can make the numbers look a little interesting. So I'll do my best to, to uh, explain and elaborate. So starting with the balance sheet, the statement of financial position at the end, again, this is a snapshot of what was in the accounts at the end of uh, December 31st, 2020. You can see the cash and investments balance has increased uh, from 49.5 to 62.8 million dollars. Um, some large, uh, you know, like the restart grant, provincial restart grant coming in late in the year, some large amounts of money coming in there to, to boost the cash balance. Total financial assets have increased similarly um, by about 13 million to 66 million. Uh, debt, so increased debt during the year to pay for uh, some capital projects and then paid down on schedule. So we've got about a $1.5 million increase in debt and total liabilities have increased from 34 million to 40 million. So the net financial asset position, if I take these total financial assets, subtract off the liabilities of 40 million, I get $26.5 million, which uh, has increased uh, from the prior year. Uh, I mentioned some new debt here uh, to pay for tangible capital assets. So we see a net increase in tangible capital assets of, uh, from 159 million to 163 million. And at the end of the year, there is an accumulated surplus balance uh, of 190 million, an increase of about 12 million from the prior year. And you can see most of that is tied up in this physical assets number. So I will explain the accumulated surplus in a future slide, but bear in mind that the vast majority of this 190,000 is not cash. It is physical assets, um, water, sewer, roads, buildings, equipment, that type of thing, stuff you can touch. Um, not, not cash and investments. On the uh, operations income statement side of things, you can see here, as you would expect coming into the pandemic, we saw decreases in recreation revenue, decreases in transportation. Those are the areas that were definitely hit, uh, you know, uh, everywhere that, that we work with, every community that we talk to, that was the expectation was to see um, decreased activity there due to the pandemic. So we do see a drop in revenue from 67 to 62. Uh, a lot of that coming through changes in grant funding, some very specific projects from year to year. Um, we know that the restart grant did a good, uh, a good uh, was a good helper um, to restore some of those recreation revenues. On the expense side, the message there would be cost containment um, and in the pandemic, trying to make sure that you were smart with um, where the spending was going. So about a $1.3 million decrease in total expenses for the year and an annual surplus of about $11.4 million. Capital assets, as I mentioned, there was more grant funding in the prior year. Uh, and you can see that the purchases and the capital activity has decreased. Um, again, $10.2 million of capital activity in 2019 down to six and a half in 2020. So uh, yeah, timing on some of those projects that had wrapped up or were finishing up in 2020, but also uh, less, less capital spending overall. Uh, and then developer contributions, the other impact on revenue and decrease is the prior year had almost $10 million of developer contributions down to about 3.6. So this is when the developer finishes their subdivision and hands over the roads, water, sewer, street lighting, sidewalks, all that to the city. And you can see less activity around that in 2020. So that's a look at a um, bunch of the numbers that have accounting adjustments in them. I want to unwind that a bit and look at the cash flows uh, and the actual cash up. Uh, moving to the main bank accounts at the city, operations had a net cash inflow of 16.7 million, so up from the 11.7 of the prior year. We can see again capital activity was down from the prior year, it's about just shy of 5.5 million dollars. Uh, so amounts transferred out of the main bank accounts into investments to try and earn a better rate of return. Uh, so oh, $9.8 million there. And then you see your debt repayments of $934,000 in the prior year, about a $3 million new debt uh, issue during the year offset by your repayments during the year. So this is a net number, uh, $3 million of debt proceeds and the, and the $900,000 of regular debt payments. So at the end of the year, the main bank accounts had a net cash inflow of 3.4 million, very similar to the prior year's 3.2 from a cash management perspective. 
And then I did promise I would mention what's in this $190 million big accumulated surplus. Again, most of it is $151 million invested in the physical assets, the things that you can touch. There's an additional $20 million set aside in reserves, you know, an increase from the 16.6 million of the prior year. Capital fund has a balance of 1.3 million. Operating fund about 14.8, and gaming down a little bit, as, which is as we would expect with uh, with what's happening with the gaming revenues uh, of 1.68 uh, million there. I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, out of the financials uh, and talk about our audits. Uh, so we're happy this year to be able to provide another clean audit opinion, so an unqualified opinion. Um, we are satisfied that the financial statements are presented. Um, fairly in all material respects in accordance with the, the appropriate public sector accounting standards. We're ready to sign the report, ready to wrap up. Uh, we've got all, all the paperwork, all the documents. Uh, the last step is, is council approval of the financials here tonight. Again, when we're doing our audit, we look at the controls in place at the city to make sure that we're comfortable that you're getting accurate financial reporting. We sample transactions throughout the year. We don't look at every transaction. That's just not, not uh, realistic. Uh, in the cost benefit of, of doing an audit. Um, another thank you to uh, staff uh, and management at the city for all their assistance um, with the audit this year. I know Renata mentioned Chris that uh, very much uh, a key piece for us. Uh, confirmation that we are independent with respect to the city. Uh, so we did one other project. Um, I think we're looking at it. Uh, we have some of our consultants looking at the solid waste phase two, I believe. Um, Totally separate team. They're, they're not uh, no overlap with the audit team there. I do have to disclose that, that we're doing some other work, but that work doesn't doesn't impact on the financial statements and on the financial statement audit. Uh, so, uh, and then I'll end with uh, a little bit of financial analysis. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we were looking at 2020 and and, and all the you know, the effects of the pandemic and and very specific things of 2020. But we like to look at what what's been going on for the last five years and what are some trends and what that might mean to the city. So we start by looking at uh, a sustainability ratio. So this is comparing your financial assets to liabilities, kind of a, a liquidity ratio, how liquid is the city. Um, the magic number in this ratio is number one. If your ratio is above one, you have funds, you have um, you know, cash and investments put aside to pay for the future. Uh, pay for future projects. If you dip below one, it means your debt is higher than your assets and you're now taxing or raising revenues in the future to pay for the past. So uh, for the city, this ratio has been steadily increasing for the past five years. Uh, it's currently 1.66. It was 1.54 in 2019. It's a, a, an upward trend of uh, a healthy liquidity balance uh, and sustainability for the city. The next one we look at is flexibility. So here we're focusing in on the physical assets, the capital assets, um, looking at a really a, a rough estimate of age. So we take the depreciated value of the assets over time. That's the, uh, the value that would estimate the usage uh, and the useful lives of those assets. And then we compare it to the original historic cost when you purchased it, not the replacement value right now if you had to replace something, but what, was, what did it originally cost when you, when you purchased it or built it? So the carrying value here, um, the 61 and a half percent is not necessarily the uh, a number to focus on, but it's what's the trend doing? So this one's been fairly steady for the last five years, anywhere from 61.3 to 62.6. What that tells me, us is the capital projects that you're doing are staying on top of some of that replacement. When you start to see this number dropping, 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 it means you've got aging assets and you're not staying on top of some of that replacement and maintenance activity. Um, and it, uh, it, um, inversely, if this number is climbing, you're putting a lot of money into capital. So you're holding steady there at about 61 and a half percent. And the last one, um, last ratio that we talk about is we call it vulnerability. Really, it's looking at you've got your own sources of revenue. You've got taxation revenue, uh, user fees, other, uh, other sources there. And then you've got government transfers and other levels of government funding, whether it's provincial or federal. And we look at this one to see how, you know, what's that mix between your own revenues and the government transfers. Usually it's, it's been around five to 10% for the last five years. 2020, the ratio was 
most of that 10% is that, that COVID restart grant um, that came in late in the year and, and made the big boost on the government transfers and it wasn't something planned or anticipated. And it's also not tied to any capital projects. Usually what we see in large, uh, when there's a large ratio for this one is it's a capital project and there was a large um, government grant for that capital project. So this, the 10% is not out of line with the last few years, um, just on the higher side of the last few ones. So thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to my presentation. I'm gonna stop the sharing so that I can see everybody's smiling faces again. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about the financials or uh, the audit process. Excellent. Thanks very much for your presentation, Corey. Uh, great as usual, uh, uh, <clears throat> nice and uh, uh, to the point. Uh, maybe while I'm waiting to see if there's other people that have questions, uh, one, one question I would have, you talked about that ratio, uh, uh, you know, the over one is good and you're kind of a 1.6 or, or so and, and kind of trending upwards. Um, uh, and I, I guess my question uh, to that is, uh, is there a number that's too high or a ratio that's too high where, where it sort of you start um, uh, possibly doing something that, that has an impact someplace else? Thank you, Mr. Ray. That's a great question. Um, I mean, there is definitely a, a balance. Uh, you know, if your ratio was three, four, five, and you have three times as much cash as, 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 as what you've got coming up in payments, um, it would start to look like you're putting aside a lot of money. Uh, there's a fine balance always uh, between the taxation levels and the debt balances that you're carrying. Um, but it, it, it's not... Um, not unusual to see some people putting money aside for a large project, in which case you get a few years where it skews really high and then it can dip way down because often if in a large project scenario, you're either grant funding some of it or putting a large amount of new debt on the books. So um, for some communities uh, on the smaller side, we see a lot of variability there. For a community the size of, of the city, the stability is what we're used to seeing and some are between one and two quite honestly, um, of a city that for all the communities that I work with, the ones that are closest in size to, to Courtney, um, somewhere between one and two seems to be that magic spot. So th thanks very much for that. And, and that has uh, given some time to generate some questions. Uh, Councillor Frisch. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mayor. And uh, thanks, Corey, for the uh, presentation. Um, and thanks to staff for working so hard to get this done. I wanted to zone in just a little bit on the uh, developer contribution, which seemed like um, quite a big change. It was uh, $6 million less from last year. And, um, and I don't know if you have any comments about it, but it seems to me that uh, we've been working towards infill development and a lot of densification, which doesn't come along with a lot of those linear assets that you were talking about as taking on when a developer finishes and I was going to point out that in um, in one sense we call it a net asset, but in another sense it's actually something of a liability to have a brand new road or a brand new big water line because obviously down the road that that's going to need to be replaced and everyone's used to enjoying it. So it ends up costing us uh, in the future to replace it. So um, we could almost look at that in a positive light in some senses. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, maybe I'll start and 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 then uh, I'll let staff jump in if they want to. The um, the first part, the variability in those numbers, very much sort of um, dependent on the developer, uh, on you know the, the community and the, and the construction companies that are in the community building. Um, you are right; the infill doesn't generate as much in terms of that sort of end of the road, end of the line, adding on water sewer and things like that. We know there are a few in, you know, on the edges um, that definitely add more. Um, but it, 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 that is a number that tends to fluctuate uh, up and down significantly um, depending on development activity. Um, I know some of the permitting activity will probably have an impact in future years of, of what's coming online. Um, but it is a good point that uh, those numbers might be smaller. That is not necessarily a revenue number that you're relying on. It's not a cash number, it's assets. So the flip of that and the, the backup of, of your comment counselor is very much on the money that these are assets that you then have to maintain. 
that this is a water line, a sewer line, a, you know, a road that is now the city's responsibility. And so you have your development cost charges and other things to plan into that uh, while it, it does boost your revenue and, and your annual surplus and your financial numbers there, the reality is it's an asset you're taking on um, and it's a big cost to the city. Okay, thanks so much for your thoughts. Thanks, Councillor Frisch. And next is Councillor McCullough. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks for the presentation, Corey. Um, it's always great to see this work come back, and I also want to thank staff for all the hard work that's gone on in the last year. I know 2020 is a year that um, I don't think any of us are going to soon forget, and I, I know that there was a lot of uh, a lot of juggling that went into um, making our finances work for the city over the last year, so I, I want to express my appreciation. Um, one number that kind of caught my eye as you were going through your presentation was um, just the decrease in, in our um, capital expenditures. And I, I know um, part of the reason for that is just simply that we, we couldn't get the work done given the, the state of things. And I, I'm wondering if you um, have it handy at your fingers there, just what the difference was between what was budgeted for, for capital projects and what we were able to um, get done last in 2020. Apologies, I don't have the budget numbers in front of me. I'll defer to staff if they have the financials and the uh, budget capital number. Thank you, Corey. Um, unfortunately, I don't have I don't have the numbers in front of me. I know that a um, couple months ago, uh, council requested for the finance department to prepare a briefing note to address any kind of actual to budget variances as well as any cost savings or, or revenue losses that um, the city suffered in 2020. And uh, we are preparing that briefing note and those, those numbers for you. Uh, we were just concentrating at this point on preparing these financial statements in order to meet the May 15th statutory deadline. So we're hoping to, to have that uh, to, to council in the next uh, couple of weeks. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks for um, that. I wasn't sure where that was at. So Mr. Like Mayor, did you want to jump in, Mr. Mayor? Uh, uh, through to Councillor McCollum, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Vanderhorst, I think Councillor McCollum was referencing a slide that you had there. So you do have a different. You listed a difference in the the two values. Is Councillor McCollum? Is that what the slide you're referencing? Uh, no, it just it jog, jogged my memory. Okay. We didn't right. get the answer. Thanks. But and that's fine. The answer from staff is great. So yeah, that's that's yeah. good. And there, there is a slide with six and a half million capital spend as the budget number I don't have in front of me. Yeah, that, that's not a problem. Um, thanks for that. I did have another question too that um, cropped up from looking through the financial statements, but I, I'm not sure that it's a question. Well, I, I'm quite certain it's not a question for you, Corey. Um, okay. Just looking at our, our cash and investments, um, the, the numbers increase quite substantially. And I imagine part of that is, is simply from having um, funds that are, are budgeted for this year to make up that capital difference. But it, it, it's an increase of 13 million. And um, it, it appears that we're um, managing that money slightly differently. And we've purchased some um, some type of fund from MFA. I, I didn't write down what it was. Um, and uh, in the last year, I've been appointed as the um, representative uh, for the CVRD to the MFA. And uh, I attended the AGM virtually maybe a month or two ago. And there was quite a lot of um, discussion and information that was delivered to members um, about some of the more ethically screened funds, as well as um, there's a few different options now with fossil free. Uh, sorry, fossil fuel free um, short term bonds and very short term bonds. And I'm wondering if um, our staff has received any information about those and if they're considered when we're making these purchases through MFA. Thank you, Councillor McCollum. Um, so that is correct. Uh, we did invest $50 million with the money market fund with MFA. Um, basically, we had a, a Scotia Bank. Um, a GIC, $5 million that came due and we had some, some extra funds and we thought we would invest in something liquid that if that we still need the money, it's easily accessible. We didn't want to lock it in with the decreasing interest rates, um, mm -hmm. but certainly the, the funds are uh, available. Um, 
and overall their cash balance is a little bit larger because um, we ended up kind of looking what's what's due when and the final payment for example for school taxes what's not due till December 31st so we tried to hold on to the money as long as we could earn the interest in our bank account rather than making the payment to the province um, in July when originally the, the the payment would have been due so just a little bit watching the, the cash flows and um, keeping the money as long as we can in our bank account to earn as much interest, even though the interest rates are decreasing. Thank you. That sounds very good. Thanks for the answer. And just one final um, follow-up question. Is there an investment policy within the city that we follow or, or do we just go with what's uh, written out in the legislation? Uh, thank you, Councillor McCollum. Um, we, we don't have an investment policy, but we certainly uh, invest our money with, with the major five banks and with MFA, we try to be very um, conservative and not uh, put the city funds at risk with, with uh, other banking institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent, thanks Councillor uh, Morin for that. And uh, thanks for staff. Um, any other questions or comments regarding uh, our audited financial statements, and I don't see any. So um, again, I think it's uh, fairly straightforward. So uh, anybody opposed to receipt, or sorry, not receipt, but to the motion uh, that was presented earlier? And I don't see anybody opposed. And so that is received uh, and passed. Uh, so uh, Corey, thanks again for your presentation. And, um, and you can now, um, I guess just turn your camera off and go do something else. So I really appreciate your time and the effort. And, and again, as been mentioned, uh, staff's uh, work on this project as well. It's much, much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Excellent. And with that, um, we'll jump into the emergency shelter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to move that uh, based on the April 26, 2021 staff report, emergency pandemic shelter 685 Cliff Avenue, Council approve option one and authorize staff to work with the external legal counsel to amend the current license to occupy agreement between the Comox Valley Transition, Transition Society and the city of, of uh, and the city for the property having a legal description of PID 00610230, lot three, section 61, Comox District Plan VIP 3817 to temporarily permit the operation of an emergency pandemic shelter at 685 Cliff Avenue, including the following conditions. A, permit the operation of an emergency pandemic shelter from May 1st, 2021 to October 5th, 2021, or until such time as the provincial state of emergency is rescinded, whichever comes or occurs first. B, include all applicable shelter operation terms and conditions originally contained within the February 22nd, 2021 license of occupation agreement number three and the March 31st. Uh, hold on a minute. My computer screen has just gone blank <laughs> in the middle of the resolution. You think it's coming back? I've got it back, yes. Excellent. Um, and other amendments deemed necessary by staff or under the advice of legal counsel to facilitate the temporary operation of an emergency pandemic shelter and transfer liability to the license holder. And C, sleeping accommodation to be strictly limited to 10 or less. And that council exercise their authority under BC Building Code section 1.1.1.1 F4 and exempt the emergency pandemic shelter located at 685 Cliff Avenue from the BC Building Code, having deemed it to be a temporary emergency facility during the provincial state of emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Second. Excellent. Thanks so much for, for the that motion there, uh, Councillor uh, Hillian. And, and I do understand the uh, computers need to, uh, I guess, go into sleep mode or whatever, I guess. Uh, uh, to, uh, to rest. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, with that, um, I will pass over to staff, uh, CAO uh, Jeff uh, Garbett. Thanks. Uh, through the mayor, uh, Ms. O'Connell will introduce this. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. Um, so the uh, as, as at the last council meeting, you did hear from the 
Coalition to End Homelessness and the Comox Valley Transition Society in regard to the operations of the Connect Warming Center, as well as the Extreme Weather Shelter and the One Month Emergency Pandemic Shelter. Um, at the time or prior to that presentation, we were hopeful that a alternative location uh, was identified and we would be talking about a relocation of the shelter and potential expansion of services due to need. But um, uh, that information changed uh, last week when the landlord of the new location had changed their mind in regard to renting it for those intended purposes. So tonight, uh, the resolution looks a little bit different um, because under the previous extreme weather shelter designation, as well as the emergency pandemic shelter operations that took place throughout the month of April, both of those shelters were funded through BC Housing. So the understanding was that, um, or the expectation was that should council have not necessarily approved of exempting the shelter component from the BC building code, as is now outlined in the resolution that the province would have asserted their paramountcy um, uh, as a provincially funded program. The reason why the resolution is different this time is because the funding to continue should council approve to do so the provision of the emergency pandemic shelter has not been determined as far as the source goes. So as of this time, um, there has not been a commitment from BC Housing that they would be providing the operating funds to the coalition and the transition society to continue to run the shelter. Um, I will keep council updated as that information becomes available. So essentially, um, if you go into the discussion of the report, because time was of the essence, you know, that this came to council last Monday, you're now seeing a report before you just one week later, and the current emergency pandemic shelter operations and the amendment to the license agreement expire at the end of April. Um, I had to look at what was the most uh, feasible option for a continuity of the overnight extreme weather, extreme pandemic, emergency pandemic shelter, um, how that would be facilitated. So essentially the two options tonight is put before you, one of them being um, the continuation of the emergency pandemic shelter. Uh, this one would require, as mentioned in the motion, um, specific direction from council or acknowledgement from council that council would be exempting the overnight shelter component from the BC building code. Please be mindful that uh, BC building code and fire codes are there for a reason. You know, they protect the health and safety of the folks who are accessing, using and working in that building. That said, as mentioned in the report, we have put it other extra conditions in place, such as the requirement for a dedicated fire warden for those overnight shifts um, and things like that. But there always is an inherent risk when you're looking at um, uh, exempting a building from the code, from the BC building code. So the reason why we're rec recommending a limit of no more than 10 is really to do with the fire alarm component. So if you have 10 or less, then it doesn't the building doesn't require an integrated fire alarm. Uh, it should be noted that this doesn't mean that the fire alarm is the only piece of code we would be exempting them from. We haven't done a code review on the building. So other things like firewall separations, um, emergency exits, processes, other building uh, requirements such as that, we, we haven't complete, conducted an audit that's quite a, a lengthy and expensive process to undertake. Um, but we thought that you know this was one way, if we kept it under 10, then at least some of the fire components uh, would not require an exemption. Your alternative option is to take no action tonight. And with that, it would essentially mean that the emergency pandemic shelter and the extension on the license would expire at the end of April. So after April 30th, um, the overnight shelter would close down. Connect Warming Center would still remain. They have a license in place until October 5th. But the, the concerns or the issues that we had to kind of look at were what happens when those folks are displaced from a shelter they've become somewhat reliant upon during the, pro the, the time of the pandemic. So one of the concerns is they get displaced and we see them arrive or pop up elsewhere within the community. So for example, in parks and other public spaces, as they may have very limited alternative housing options to transition to in the event of the, the overnight shelter closure. 
the financial implications. So some of this is repeat from previous reports because I kind of carry the information through so you're aware of kind of a running tally. Um, so when council had extended the warming center, um, it's kind of hand in hand with the shelter because they piggyback on the same operations. But the increase or the net increased cost of 12,600 over what our operating budget to maintain the vacant building was, was accounted for in the 2021 budget. And then the, the only addition would be um, the cost for the legal fees, because this, should council approve it, will represent amendment number five on this agreement. So each one of those amendments obviously has a cost. Um, as we're repeating the same terms and conditions of previous amendments, we are able to um, keep those costs relatively low, considering the amount of legal work that would have normally been required. And I don't think this will be surprising either, considering the number of times you've seen me present to you on the warming center in just the past six months, um, that approximately 185 hours of staff time have been dedicated to the license or related amendments, um, consulting on jurisdiction and our authority in this pandemic or the state of emergency, as well as some stakeholder discussions, uh, talking to the other departments, including building and fire. Um, and then also the fire department graciously provided fire training to the staff at the warming center as well. And that's the report in a nutshell. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to give you a myriad of options on such short notice, but if council's goal is to maintain a service continuity of the emergency pandemic shelter, um, the recommendation is to go ahead with option one. So I'm available to answer any questions should you have them. Thanks so much for your uh, uh, report, uh, Ms. O'Connor. Really appreciate that. And we do have a couple of questions and comments here. So uh, first we have um, uh, Councillor uh, Hilling. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thanks uh, very much to Director O'Connell uh, for all the hours spent on this, uh, and most particularly those spent uh, during her weekend to get this report to us today. Um, it's an excellent report uh, under the circumstances. And I want to stress that the circumstances that we're in are exceptional. Um, apart from uh, the ongoing homelessness crisis, uh, we are still in a global pandemic. I've always maintained that if there was a, some type of disaster where local residents were driven from their homes by fire, flood, earthquake, or other measure, we'd be opening rec centers and other uh, public facilities to provide temporary shelter. That's essentially what we're doing here for a group of our most vulnerable uh, citizens who don't in fact have a home. And uh, we have uh, reports uh, from the uh, people who are running the program, the community agencies, of the difference that is making in uh, not only giving those people a, a place to, to sleep, but access to services. Um, I wanna stress that uh, uh, it, when the agencies go to BC Housing, as uh, some of us will be accompanying them this week, to uh, push for uh, funds to continue to operate, the fact of the city's support uh, does make a difference. And when we have the opportunity to meet with the minister, push for more permanent solutions uh, to our homelessness crisis, the fact that the city has stepped up to provide these interim services will also make a difference in my view. So um, the last thing I wanna say is that um, I know that um, location of this uh, uh, facility uh, with sleeping accommodation presents challenges uh, that uh, we've heard addressed at previous meetings. Um, I wanna acknowledge the, um, the efforts of uh, Heather Ney and her uh, colleagues through at the Transition Society in reaching out to merchants and other members of the community to address these concerns and to say that um, uh, I think our continued support is important, but at the same time, that uh, we push for uh, more long lasting solutions that will actually provide this service in a different part of the community uh, along uh, the lines of what uh, the Transition Society and the Homelessness Coalition have suggested. We will keep working towards those goals and uh, the passage of this motion today will help us in that direction. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor Hillian, appreciate that. And uh, Councillor Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you so much for this, Kate. I was also noting that it arrived on Saturday and thinking of how much time you must have spent. Um, to The turnaround on this was just remarkable, so thank you for this carefully crafted report. I would echo everything that Councillor Hillian said about the importance of this, uh, of this resource for our community in time of pandemic. 
And I just had a, a small technical question. I guess I was just wondering if uh, what, if any, impact this would have on insurance for the building and safety of the occupant and um, any insurance ramifications of the building itself and, and the occupants and their, their coverage. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cole Hamilton. That's a great question. So the question of insurance was raised when the extreme weather shelter was put forward um, back in December of 2020. So the insurance requirements from the extreme weather shelter to an emergency pandemic shelter have not changed. So all of those insurance requirements were covered under amendment number three. Great, so this doesn't uh, essentially change the situation at all. Okay, that's, that's reassuring to hear. Great, thanks very much, Kate. Excellent, thanks Councillor Cole Hamilton and Councillor Moran. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, Ms. O'Connell, I noticed that um, the um, Transition Society had reported that there were, I think 12 to 14 staying in, in the, um, in the building, um, but that this this um, resolution uh, um, limits that to ten. Is that correct? So there wouldn't be um, there wouldn't be the ability to go beyond the ten. It sounds like in future. So there would there would be a couple, two to four people who who would still be turned away. I'm assuming. Uh, thank you, Councillor Morin. So the council does have the option of amending the the overnight um, sleeping accommodation to a, a greater number. The difference is as soon as you go over 10 and perhaps Chief Bardonix would, would want to speak to this, that's when some, a lot of those fire related um, code requirements are triggered. Mm -hmm. So even though in the motion we're talking about transitioning some of the liability over to the license holder, so being the Transition Society and the Coalition to End Homelessness, um, the city will always, as the land landlord or landowner and one of the larger players within the agreement, maintain a certain level of liability. So um, the recommendation in speaking with um, what the deputy fire chief was to keep it at 10 or less to show that we were trying to find a balance between code requirements, but also recognizing the need. So when the Transition Society originally proposed the extreme weather shelter, they estimated they needed eight beds. So that's what we had built all our plans on. And my understanding is that the 12 to 14 is not necessarily a consistent night total um, and that there is some spaces still available at the Pidcock shelter. So perhaps there'd be an opportunity to shift some folks to Pidcock to take up some of those empty beds. Um, so you're not seeing two to four people uh, turned away each night as a result of the 10 person limit. But perhaps um, uh, Chief Bardonix would like to speak to the fire code requirements. Yes, Mayor and Council. Um, it's part of the building code requirements uh, for the occupancy of 10 or over requiring the um, fire alarm system, potentially uh, sprinkler system. Uh, what's in the fire code, it's also uh, section 2.8 of the fire code. It also includes uh, a fire safety plan that's required once we go over uh, 10 fire drills, that sort of things that comply with it as well. Great, thank you. Um, I just had a follow-up comment. I've had the occasion to go by there a few times in the last little while, and I was really impressed to see staff outside interacting with folks. Um, it actually seemed fairly quiet there. Certainly people, you know, have all their belongings with them because there's nowhere else to put them. Um, but I noticed that folks are kind of, you know, uh, against the back wall and keeping the debris down fairly well. So that indicates to me that, um, that the staff are, are working with people um, to try to keep that you know, as tidy as possible. Um, you know, it's very uncomfortable for many of us to see people in that kind of distress. And and yes, there are times when when there's perhaps open open drug use, etc. I I kind of liken it to um, you know when when I've been around as a young person or even older folks who are um, really intoxicated. Um, from drinking and some of the the kind of obnoxious behaviors that you can see 
And that happens with some people, but not everybody. And I, and I, I hope that we come to a place um, where we, we, we get rid of this hierarchy of, of substance use in terms of how um, one, one substance is, is more acceptable than another, because it's really the behaviors that go with, um, go with um, the substances that are, that are the problem. And I think um, not everybody who's going to the shelter has those issues. Some do, some don't. And um, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Hillian that um, my hope is that the city showing um, how much we've done to, to help with this, this issue will go a long way with those conversations with the province because we do need the assistance of higher government to, to deal with this. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor uh, Morin. Appreciate your comments. Um, and uh, Councillor Hillian. Thank you, Mayor. And I just want to clarify the, this uh, issue of um, the numbers. Um, it is my understanding that uh, this will involve uh, turning people away, um, which of course risks uh, the um, challenge that uh, you know they will camp in the parking lot or other such uh, concerns. I'm just wondering if um, Director O'Connell could speak to um, to uh, what our um, uh, where, where we would uh, land on uh, the disadvantage of, um, of extending uh, the numbers versus the, the potential problems if we, if we leave the limit at 10. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hillian. It, it's one of those circumstances where the risk and, li and reliability to the city would only truly be known in the event of some type of catastrophe or fire or things like that, right? So um, in in regard to the the 10 person limit, when speaking with the deputy fire chief, that was where, you know, you're not going to have a, a fire chief or a building inspector um, ever recommend not adhering to a building code, right? It's it's their, their job to enforce the code to protect the health and safety of, of anyone who's accessing or using that building. So whether or not the risk is marginal or substantive, moving from 10 individuals to 14. That's not information I could provide. A lot of that would take place in the event of a, an emergency and potential damages or loss of life. So um, uh, that unfortunately, it's not something I could, could quantify. I, I look to the code experts being the fire department and the building department. And the recommendation is based upon their their information, how we could potentially mitigate potential liability in the event of a fire or other event. So if we were to turn down that aspect of the recommendation, uh, we'd essentially be exposing the city to a higher liability in the event of, uh, of a significant uh, risk event. If I could, uh, through to council in total, uh, I think the recommendation in front of you tr attempts to balance that. So uh, we, we uh, I would echo with what Ms. Connell and Chief Baronix has said, um, and we know that we're not gonna meet all needs, uh, but we're doing our very best. And I think we'll continue to do that. And again, we need to give you defensible recommendations that, uh, that are that balance. And I think that's, um, you know, I kind of think you've been given that, that overview. Well, Mr. Mayor, I know that, um, you know, we have uh, interested people uh, from the community who are likely tuning in watching this to see what the council decision is. And uh, I, th I think on the balance of, um, of judgment, uh, um, we do need to go with the staff recommendation, but at the same time, uh, double our efforts to uh, work with uh, BC Housing to address uh, the, the, the um, deficits that um, that even this plan uh, will leave and uh, it just uh, illustrates uh, how challenging this problem is to resolve uh, despite uh, our best efforts uh, <clears throat> which certainly go beyond uh, what any council uh, in the past has done in these circumstances thank you and Thanks. sorry councillor hillian just to clarify as well uh, should it be bc housing or the province that ends up funding the operating or funding the program for the emergency pandemic shelter moving forward 
in the event that the provincial government through BC Housing decides that they need to have more folks in that building than what council has permitted, they can then assert their paramountcy to ignore all code regulations, but that would be the decision of the province to take on that extra risk, right? So if the province decides that they, they need 16 people in that building, they have the authority to do that through the legislation. That's a very helpful clarification. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Excellent. And, and uh, a great discussion on this uh, very complex and difficult issue. And, and you know, we have had many conversations, uh, uh, whether it be with BC Housing or the province, and, and we'll continue to be doing uh, this and bringing it up on a regular, um, uh, um, on a regular basis. So um, th thanks for your comments. Oh, uh, Councillor Moore. Sorry to slide another one in there. Um, I'm wondering if staff could refresh my memory. Um, the other side of the building that is being used for storage, I, I know there was some discussion about that. I'm, I, could you please refresh my memory on um, on uh, why we were not able to, to utilize that other part of the space? Uh, thank you, Councillor Morton. And unfortunately, I don't know enough about the other side of the building. I understand it's where our archival records are stored. Um, but I haven't been physically in that portion of the building or looked at that as a potential expansion of the shelter or the warming center. I'm not sure if any of council remembers that or the mayor. Um, anyway, oh. Well, you may recall, Councillor Morin, that uh, originally there was a hope that um, the building could be in fact renovated uh, to take mm -hmm. down the, the wall and uh, make use of all the space, but uh, significant structural issues uh, prevented that from being able to happen. Right. And uh, I think that um, the challenge is that if you open up the second uh, side, you've got uh, double the staffing that you're going to require and uh, all the other issues that go with that. Um, there may be right. more to it, but off the top of my head, that's, uh, that's what I, I would have to say. Yeah, I did recall the, the renovation um, issue. Did our CAO have anything else to add? Okay. Uh, through, the, through the mayor to council, Councillor Hillian uh, was going where I was headed there. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Councillor Morin, for, for clarification there. Um, and with that, I think we've had a, a good discussion. Um, there is a motion on the table. So I will uh, pull council, starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Frisch. I'm in favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Uh, Councillor Morin. In favor. And Councillor Theos. Favor. And I'm in favor as well. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and next on the agenda is the Comox Valley uh, RCMP quarterly report. Um, I'll move receipt of the report, please, Mayor. Thanks. Second. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Councillor Theos. Uh, for seconding that, I saw, I saw that. Uh, it's all good. Uh, all right. Um, uh, did uh, uh, CAO, Mr. Uh, Garbett, did you want to speak to the quarterly report at all? I I, I know you, it, it's 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 a new report, but uh, uh, nothing. Uh, and if council had any uh, items on that report that they'd want to uh, highlight, uh, let me know. Uh, often the RCMP um, uh, inspector, uh, Kerber's officer in charge, would would uh, sometimes come and speak to some of these things, but uh, just that it is our quarterly report. Obviously, we're really looking at that trend of uh, differences between 2019 and, and 2020. Um, and uh, one of the big things that I noticed is just, you know, uh, uh, you know, a 5% increase in, in phone calls, um, which uh, during a pandemic is, is uh, you know, uh, probably one of the side effects. Uh, Councillor Morton, I do see you have your, your hand up, but, uh, uh, Mr. Garbutt, maybe before, did you have anything that you wanted to add first? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I would say that uh, if council had some questions, uh, I do have a, I'm reaching out to Inspector Kerbers. He, he and I have not yet uh, connected. I'd be happy to pass on some questions for clarification. I was advised through staff that, that it's, it is uh, regular that the inspector we, we would be with us, but uh, I think he made a presentation to council very recently. So yeah. if there were questions, I'm happy to carry them on. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Councilor Moore. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I know we, we normally do have Inspector Curvers here to ask questions. I just wanted to, to note for the 
you know, it is concerning that we've got a 38% increase in files for domestic violence um, in particular and uh, an increase in sex assault as well. Um, some of those numbers are, you know, almost double, um, you know, in, in a particular month. So I'm, I'm happy that that is one of the priorities of, of um, the, the local RCMP um, to, to look at that. But I think that's an area that we, we really need to, um, you know, keep, keep in communication with Inspector Kerber's about and see what, um, what additional measures may, um, may be utilized. I know we do have a particular um, officer who handles much of that. They're probably very overworked, I would think, this year. Um, it's certainly something that's been flagged um, nationally as an issue during COVID, um, those cases going up. In, um, so um, we know that all of our social service agencies are really um, you know, overworked right now for a variety of reasons. This adds to, to those agencies that, uh, that try to support um, women in those situations. Uh, so um, I just I just wanted to flag it, and um, maybe next time Inspector Kerbers is is here, we could um, we could chat about maybe some of the particular um, strategies that are that are being utilized to to um, you know try to to mitigate those numbers. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Morin, and and yeah, I mean it, it can be quite disturbing when you look at some some of those uh, some of those months. Uh, you know, again, talking about a thirty percent increase, but some of the months are you know, three, four times uh, what they were the previous year. Um, and, and I do know that, uh, and, and I think our council has spoken to this uh, much uh, at meetings as well as, you know, um, out, out in the community on Facebook about uh, mental health and, and making sure that we're, um, we're doing our best to uh, give people the, the tools and the phone numbers to, to reach out uh, if they need to. Uh, Councillor Hilling. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. We did have uh, Inspector Curvers with us uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, were able to uh, uh, dialogue with him on some issues. Um, having looked at crime stats for many years in my previous professional life, I'm aware that uh, they fluctuate uh, quite significantly. And there is reference in the report to break and enters uh, where they go down uh, uh, with the uh, the arrest of one particular individual who was committing a lot of them. So often year by year, it's hard to, uh, to assess what the numbers really mean. But I do um, concur with Councillor Morin that the increase in uh, domestic violence and uh, sexual assault to some extent uh, certainly uh, can be taken of, as um, signifying greater stress on uh, people uh, through the pandemic when uh, uh, people have, uh, by nature of the, these events, uh, had to spend more time at home, had to be isolated. Uh, the police, uh, as such, are, are not necessarily uh, going to be able to, to change practices to reduce these numbers because they, they really come in at the when the damage has already started. And um, while I, I certainly think there's value in, in strategizing with them around their responses, uh, I think one of the things that we can do is help to give them more tools to deal with the people who are offending. And uh, in that uh, light, I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm aware of um, the Transition Society who, that provides services uh, for women uh, escaping violence or suffering from violence are, are attempting to also provide services for men who uh, are involved in violence, both through a counseling program that uh, they operate but also through um, applying for funds to create a, um, a response so that uh, when there is an incident, not only is the, are the women and children uh, rescued and taken to safety, but there are some services provided to the uh, alleged perpetrator to try and uh, um, meet some of their needs and hopefully prevent any further incident. And I think if um, once we know a little bit more about that, they've been unsuccessful in, the, in getting funding for that program to date. But uh, once we know a little bit more, I think perhaps we can lend our support to getting further programming like that in place uh, and to hopefully make a difference uh, to these uh, concerning numbers. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Gillian. I appreciate that. Um, 
And uh, uh, with that, uh, it is just a receipt motion. Um, thanks so much for, for the dialogue we've had on that. But uh, uh, unless somebody is opposed, I'm going to uh, assume unanimous uh, receipt. Uh, and, uh, and nobody's opposed, so thanks for that. Uh, and next, we have the uh, Comox Valley uh, Regional District uh, Strengthening Communities uh, Grants uh, request. If somebody can move that. Mayor, I'm, I'm happy to move that. Um, based on the correspondence dated March 31st, 2021, from the Comox Valley Regional District regarding the regional application to the Union of BC Municipalities for grant funding through the Strengthening Communities Service Program be received for information and that the uh, City of Courtney supports CVRD's application for, to the UBCM Strengthening Community Service Program for grant funding in an amount up to $1.25 million um, to provide urgent and temporary support to unsheltered homeless populations and address related community impacts and that the City of Courtney provided support to the CVRD to apply for, receive, and manage the grant funding on behalf of the Comox Valley local governments. I'll second that. Excellent. Thanks for that. And uh, um, uh, with that, I'll pass it over to uh, CAO uh, Jeff Garvey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, some of you that are at the Regional District Board table are familiar with this. Ms. O'Connell is here. Should you have any questions, it's a relatively straightforward ask for uh, correspondence. So um, we're available for questions, but I think we can generally proceed unless council had any specifics. And I think, um, uh, yeah, Councillor Hilling. Thanks, Mayor. Just to clarify that this is a great opportunity uh, through uh, new grant funding uh, and if successful, uh, we'll um, provide some direct services that uh, will um, along the lines of what we've just been talking about in the previous uh, item on the agenda re with regards to the, the um, shelter spaces and uh, uh, related services. So um, it's, it's certainly within our interest uh, to uh, support this uh, motion, not only uh, for the um, greater good that it will serve if the funding comes through, but also because it will alleviate some of the pressures on the city of Courtney uh, uh, in relation to this uh, challenge. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Councillor Hillian, for that. Um, and I don't see any further questions or comments. Um, it does look uh, like a fairly straightforward motion. So unless somebody is opposed, I will assume it is unanimously. And I'm looking and nobody is opposed. Excellent. So um, that will be unanimously uh, moved forward. Thanks, everybody. And, and uh, I know it's part, part of... Uh, uh, a discussion we've been having tonight uh, and, and having really for the last uh, a couple of years and this last year, it's, uh, you know, I, I am really inspired by some of the work that's been done in our, our community. So really appreciate that. Uh, next, we have a uh, in-camera meeting. I can move that, Mayor. I'll uh, move that a special in-camera meeting close to the public will be held April 26, 2021 at the conclusion of the Committee of the Whole meeting pursuant to the following subsections of the Community Charter, 91C, Labor Relations or, or Other Employee Relations, 91K, Negotiations and Related Discussions Respecting the Proposed Provision of a Municipal Service that are their preliminary stages and that, in the view of the Council, could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality if they were held in public. Second. Excellent. And I'll pull council starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. And Councillor uh, Frisch. I'm in favor. Councillor Hillian. Not opposed. Councillor uh, <laughs> McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. Support. And I'm in favor as well. And I'll, 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 maybe I'll take that as next time, I'll just ask if anybody's opposed. Uh, I appreciate that, Councillor Hillian. Uh, that passes unanimously, which leaves just one thing left on the agenda. Move adjournment. Second. Second. Anybody opposed? I don't see anybody opposed. Excellent, all right, we are adjourned. Thanks everybody.